in search of answers. In his book, Apocalypse Never, Michael Schellenberger criticizes environmental alarmism, which is the systematic exaggeration and misrepresentation of facts surrounding environmental issues such as climate change. Last couple of lectures, we looked at his take on deforestation, plastic pollution, extinctions, and sweatshops. He thought that much of the rhetoric from environmentalist groups surrounding these issues was alarmist. Today we will look at the issues of fracking, food, and nuclear waste. Let's start with fracking, which is the use of hydraulic fluids in the recovery of otherwise unrecoverable natural gas and oil packets trapped in shale rock formations deep in the Earth's crust. There is quite a bit of gas and oil trapped in rocks in small packets. Indeed, conventional oil and gas are probably a small fraction of all reserves. That means fracking enables us to access an enormous amount of fossil fuels that were previously beyond our reach and therefore beyond our ability to burn and turn into energy and greenhouse gases. Here's how fracking works. First, the oil company drills a well. Then the drill bits reach the layer where the trapped oil and gas is located. Then the bit is turned 90 degrees and starts drilling horizontally, which could continue for several miles. Once the drilling is complete, the workers on the site start pumping fracking liquid into the well. This liquid is made out of more than 99% sand and water and about half a percent additives. We will get to these additives in a bit. But it is important to note that the amount of fracking liquid used is not small. Depending on the size of the well, it could add up to several million gallons. Once the well is completely filled, hydraulic pumps on the site start applying very high pressures on the liquid. The pressure gets so high it exceeds the compressive strength of the highest quality concrete. This fractures the shale rocks, hence the name fracking. It also frees up all the oil and gas packets that were trapped in the rock. Next, these freed packets are all pumped back up to the surface and recovered. This sounds kind of neat. You might be asking, what is the big deal? Why do people complain about fracking? The main problem is wastewater. Remember those millions of gallons of fracking fluid that was pumped into the well? What do we do with it? It's not clean. It's not only mixed with oil residue, but also has a bunch of additives I mentioned earlier, some of which are toxic. The cost of treating that water and making it clean enough to be dumped into a waterway would be prohibitively high. That's why most of the wastewater is left underground inside the well. The problem is that's also where most drinking water comes from. If the fracking wastewater contaminates the groundwater, that would be a disaster. To make the matters worse, there's very little regulation on what goes into these wells. Remember those additives? In the United States, there is no legal requirement for oil and gas companies to disclose what they are. Some companies voluntarily disclose some of the information, but some additives are kept as trade secrets. Schellenberger, however, thinks that the dangers of fracking are overblown. First, he correctly points out that so far, there is no evidence of groundwater contamination. Second, he argues that fracking generates large quantities of natural gas, which is the cleanest fossil fuel. I would like to hear what you think. But in case you would like to learn more about fracking, I'm linking a few articles and resources in the video description. Next item on the list is food, in particular, animals as food. As you might remember, close to half of all habitable land on Earth is used for raising animals for food. Environmentalists tend to oppose most forms of animal agriculture. A big part of this is due to the inefficiency of animal agriculture relative to plant agriculture. I won't repeat the figures, but here they are in case you need a refresher. 
But one statistic worth repeating is the fact that livestock is responsible for almost 15% of all global emissions. Schellenberger thinks that those who call for reducing or completely abolishing animal agriculture based on such environmental concerns are being alarmist. But as we will see, Schellenberger has many arguments, some of which oddly have little to do with the environment and engage concerns about human health and animal welfare instead. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and examine his arguments one by one. First, Schellenberger points out the fact that sometimes the health benefits of vegetarianism and veganism are exaggerated. Schellenberger's take on the effect of a plant-based diet on human health seem to be based on cherry-picked evidence. Indeed, all meta-analyses I could find support the conclusion that on the whole, plant-based diets are better. Indeed, a meta-analysis by Medavar and other states there is an overall robust support for beneficial effects of a plant-based diet on metabolic measures in health and disease. We shouldn't exaggerate, of course. There are also risks associated with plant-based diets. For instance, most plants are poor in vitamin B12 and iron. B12 is a micronutrient. We need about 1.5 micrograms of it a day. B12 deficiency is a serious condition that can cause permanent cognitive impairment. It is extremely rare among meat eaters because B12 is found in meat in ample quantities. But B12 is not found in fruits and most plants. According to one study, which I am linking, 77% of lacto ovo vegetarians and 92% of vegans have B12 deficiency. It sounds scary, but these statistics apply to only those who do not take multivitamin pills. Indeed, regularly using an over-the-counter multivitamin supplement reduces B12 deficiency risk to virtually zero. Iron deficiency is a bit harder to manage, although it is less serious. Our bodies need iron to bind respirated oxygen and carry it to our muscles and vital organs. Iron deficiency can cause anemia, which is also known as low red blood cell count. It can also cause low blood pressure, chronic fatigue, and even momentary loss of consciousness, which could sometimes be life-threatening due to the risk of falling and sustaining head injury. Especially red meat has significant quantities of iron, so iron deficiency is less common among meat eaters. Since females are especially prone to iron deficiency, the risk is especially high among vegetarian females. Treating iron deficiency and the resulting anemia is a bit more complicated than preventing B12 deficiency. This is so because our guts aren't very good at absorbing iron. Plus, beverages such as coffee and tea reduce absorption even further. As a result, many patients have trouble rectifying their iron deficiency with dietary supplements. There are options, however. Iron infusions, which are periodic intravenous injections of iron, work for most people. Clearly, I'm not your doctor. I'm not trying to give you medical advice. Obviously, you should talk to your doctor about your health. I'm saying all this because more than a decade of teaching food ethics, I have met hundreds of students who told me that they can't be vegetarian because of anemia. Not a single one of them knew about iron infusions. I do not want to be judgmental. But the most plausible inference to draw here is anemia is a rationalization to continue eating animals. Another risk associated with vegetarianism is decreased intestinal biodiversity. Varied diets support better gut bacteria. However, this is not a great concern. The science of gut bacteria is, to put it diplomatically, not very robust. The quality of evidence leaves a lot to be desired. What is more, the concern cuts both ways. Most meat eaters have gut, bad gut fauna because they don't eat enough plants. So, at worst, this is an insignificant concern that recommends a small amount of meat intake. At best, it is measurement noise that has no empirical significance. Finally, there is the risk of increased fructose intake. Schellenberger presents this as a significant issue, and it is.
Fructose is a naturally occurring sugar that is found in fruits and corn. However, naturally occurring is a misleading term. Since humans first domesticated fructose-bearing plants, they increased the fructose content substantially. For instance, apples were domesticated by Europeans for the first time in the Middle Ages. Back then, apples tasted like raw potatoes because the fructose content was less than a percent of what it is now. An even more dramatic transformation happened to corn. On the left, you see wild corn, which is the plant Native Americans first domesticated about 10,000 years ago. It was a plant with a few hard and starchy seeds that had to be boiled for hours to be edible. On the right, we have the modern corn, which contains not only larger and much softer seeds, but also about a thousand times more fructose. What makes increased fructose intake a problem is this. Since fructose was very rare in nature, we didn't evolve to deal with it. When ingested by humans, fructose behaves like other sugars in terms of energy and fat generation, but it doesn't stimulate the brain mechanisms responsible for satiation. If you ate more than a small amount of glucose, for example, you would get sick and throw up, but you can gulp down a pint of fructose syrup and want more. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Indeed, there is evidence that fructose is as addictive as alcohol. What does this have to do with vegetarianism? Many people who try vegetarianism and veganism fill the gap in their diet that was created by abandoning animal products by eating foods high in simple sugars, especially fructose. They often do this without realizing because fructose is so abundant both in domesticated fresh fruits and in processed foods. It is very hard to avoid it. So, Schellenberger has a point, at least here. His point, however, is a little bit overshadowed by his defense of factory farming. Indeed, there are serious health risks associated with factory farming, which he doesn't bring up. At some factory farms, for instance, animals are fed old food, which comes in plastic packaging and is put through a grinder to make feed. My goal in this course isn't to disgust you. If you are curious, just Google plastic in animal feed and there will be many videos to satisfy your curiosity. The problem with this is the fact that some of the waste material crosses the intestinal barrier and ends up in the animal's tissue, milk and eggs. This might in part explain why people with meat-based diets are more prone to certain types of cancer. Second, most factory farms crowd animals in unnatural concentrations. This makes infectious disease a serious problem. To counteract this problem, factory farms use large amounts of antibiotics. Indeed, we see a significant increase in the amount of antibiotics used in factory farms. This is due to antibiotic resistance, which is the bacteria causing infectious diseases getting more resilient against the antibiotics and requiring larger and larger doses over time to be killed. Yet this is not a problem hurting just animals. Many of the bacteria that cause illness in animals also cause illness in humans. Antibiotic resistance might soon be so high, infectious disease, which was the leading cause of death before the discovery of antibiotics, can become again one of the big killers. And finally, there is the risk of a new zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is a disease that originates from animals and infects humans. The chances of this happening is directly proportional to the number of animals we raise and interact with. If we continue to raise and eat animals by the billions as we do now, sooner or later we will have a new zoonotic disease which could, as we witnessed in 2020, kill millions of humans and cause all sorts of other harm to our societies. Next, Schellenberger makes the argument that factory farming lets more animals to be alive at a given time. There is definitely truth to this. First, domestication changed farm animals significantly and reduced their fitness. If we were to stop farming animals and let them loose in the environment, they would like to go extinct or at least become endangered. This is the red jungle fowl, a tropical bird from which chickens were domesticated. 
As you can see, even free range chickens are substantially fatter than red jungle fowls. They simply stand no chance against predators like raccoons, foxes, and coyotes. Besides, chickens have significantly smaller brains than their ancestors because we have been selectively breeding them to be more docile. Again, this makes their chances of surviving in the wild much lower. The same applies to sheep. This is a wild sheep species living in North America. And this is a domesticated sheep. The same story, more or less. Fatter body, shorter legs, smaller brain. They are clearly not as fit to survive in the wild. Based on these facts, Schellenberger considers an argument in defense of factory farming. Here's how it goes. About 1.6 billion animals live in factory farms in the U.S. alone. Matching this figure without factory farming is grossly infeasible. In fact, all small farms put together amount to less than 10 million animals. Having more animals alive at a given time indicates elevated moral value. Therefore, factory farming is more of a superior to smaller farms. I would like to hear what you think about this argument. Does it address the moral qualms some people have at factory farms? Next, Schellenberger makes two claims about treating animals as food. Killing animals isn't as bad as killing humans, and animals can be happy in factory farms. I'm not sure why he makes this point, because I think most people would concede it and find it to be completely irrelevant. Robbery, for example, isn't as bad as murder. But that doesn't mean that robbery is morally acceptable. Similarly, the idea that killing animals isn't as bad as killing humans doesn't establish the moral permissibility of killing animals. The more interesting part of his claim is the second part. Animals can be happy in factory farms. Indeed, there is a common misconception among consumers that free range means happy. This is a free range chicken. As you would notice, there are large sores on its legs and back. This is the result of putting chickens in flocks that are too big. Chickens evolved in flocks that are small, forcing them to be a part of a flock larger than approximately 80 chickens causes constant fighting and pecking. Red jungle fowl solves this problem by splitting a flock every time the flock is getting too big. Indeed, mothers encourage their chicks to leave the flock and start their own around 12 months of development. In many so-called free-range farms, the flock size is in the hundreds, if not in thousands. This results in chickens pecking each other constantly. Factory farms with cages, and some free-range farms, prevent this problem by de-beaking chicks, which is cutting off part of a baby chicken's beak with a hot blade. That way, they cannot injure each other. Unfortunately, Schellenberger fails to mention the practice of de-beaking and the evidence that it causes chronic pain. However, on the whole, he seems to be right. When we measure the stress hormones in factory farmed and non-factory farmed chickens, we don't see any difference. Both groups seem equally miserable. Next, Schellenberger makes an environmental argument based on economics. He claims that the rebound effects of switching to vegetarianism would make it a wash, environmentally speaking. A rebound effect is a consumer behavior involving increased consumption following a short period of decreased consumption due to eliminating an expenditure. Here's an example you might have witnessed yourself. You have a friend who is addicted to Starbucks. She buys several expensive lattes every day, let's say, which add up to several hundred dollars each month. To save money, she goes cold turkey. But to her surprise, she doesn't end up saving much money in the long run. Here's how this happens. Suppose your friend's monthly disposable income expenditure is about $1,000. About half of it is spent on, let's say, Starbucks. In the end of January, she decides to quit Starbucks and make coffee at home. This saves her about $500 in February. But now, she has more disposable income lying around. She decides to buy something with it, like books, vintage coffee mugs, so on and so forth. 
and she increases her spending more and more in the following months. Eventually, she completely or almost completely rebounds back to her original $1,000 a month spending habit. The study Schellenberger cites states that we consistently estimate an energy rebound effect of around 96 to 100 percent and a greenhouse gas rebound effect of around 50 percent. In other words, conversion to vegetarianism doesn't produce long-lasting environmental benefits, at least not as much as we would expect just from looking at the energy expenditure and emissions associated with plant versus animal agriculture. I would like to hear what you think about this rebound effect. Finally, Schellenberger goes for the gut punch and argues that ethical and environmental vegetarianism and veganism originate from emotional reactions as opposed to rational thought. According to a group of researchers he cites, vegetarians and vegans associate meat products with death and other things that cause negative emotions. Hence, they are repulsed by meat products. To critically evaluate Schellenberger's accusation, we should think about a simple sounding question. What is the basis of morality? But this simple sounding question is actually complex. It contains two separate questions. First, where does moral motivation come from? Here, by moral motivation, I mean the desire or incentive to act. Moral motivation isn't the same as moral conviction. There are many people who are seriously convinced that they should do this or that, but they cannot bring themselves to doing them. Think of me, for instance. I sincerely believe that I should stop playing video games and donate the time and money I spend on video games to charity. But do I stop playing video games? Do I donate to charity? No. Why? Because I suck. I lack moral motivation, at least as far as this moral belief is concerned. Then there is the question, where does moral justification come from? Justification is about the evidence and reasons one has for a belief. So, moral justification is about what evidence and reasons we have for our moral beliefs. Moral justification and moral motivation aren't the same thing. Justification isn't a matter of motivation because it is not a matter of what you want. It is a matter of what is true or credible. For instance, I don't like grading. I just hate it. So my motivation to grade is typically very low. Does that mean that I don't have a moral obligation to grade? Of course not. I am morally obligated to grade your work in a timely manner, in part because it is my job, and in part because you deserve the opportunity to get feedback and see what you can do to improve your work. Now, Schellenberger accuses vegetarians and vegans of basing their moral judgments, moral beliefs on emotions. By this, it could mean two things. First, they are getting more their moral motivation from emotions. Or, second, they are driving moral justification from emotions. Let's assess each possibility and see what could be wrong with it. Can emotions motivate moral behavior? Or should we shun our emotions completely when it comes to acting on our moral convictions? This man is Ted Bundy, a serial killer who kidnapped and murdered at least 30 women, probably more. One of the dominant theories about Bundy among the psychiatrists who examined him was that he had psychopathy, which is a mental condition with diminished or absent prosocial emotions and extremely poor judgment. Lacking such emotions made him a monster. Indeed, there's plenty of evidence from brain science that damage to the parts of the brain processing prosocial emotions such as compassion, love, gratitude, shame, and guilt is strongly associated with poor judgment. So emotions can motivate moral behavior. Prosocial emotions are key to morality. Without them, we cannot act morally. So the answer to the first question is clear. Moral motivation comes largely, or maybe even entirely, from emotions. So if vegetarians and vegans are being emotional in this sense, they aren't doing anything wrong. The next question is, 
Can emotions justify moral beliefs? On this issue, there is a famous debate between two schools of thought, moral sentimentalism and moral rationalism. Moral sentimentalism is the view that emotions can justify moral beliefs. Scottish philosophers Adam Smith and David Hume are the most influential moral sentimentalists. Moral rationalism, on the other hand, is the idea that emotions cannot justify moral beliefs. For moral rationalists, the evidence and reasons for a moral belief must come from a purely rational or logical process that doesn't factor in any emotions whatsoever. The most famous moral rationalist is the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. And it's clear where Schellenberger's sympathies lie. He is also a moral rationalist because he thinks that vegetarians and vegans are making a mistake by mixing emotions and moral justification. He seems right about at least part of the claim. Many ethical and environmental vegetarians and vegans justify their beliefs that we shouldn't eat animals by talking about their feelings or the feelings of the animals who are the victims of the process. But is Schellenberger right about the claim that emotions cannot play that role? As always, I would like to hear what you think. But taking a step back and looking at the big picture, I'm a bit perplexed. This book, as far as I can tell from its introduction and title, is about environmental alarmism and its dangers to us and the planet. But four out of five arguments I could identify in this chapter have nothing to do with environmental alarmism. I suspect that Schellenberger has some serious beef, so to speak, with vegetarianism and veganism, which goes beyond his concerns about environmental alarmism. I think that's why this chapter at many points reads more like a rant and less like a level-headed analysis. And it is really a shame because I think the rentiness distracts the reader from the overall message and casts serious suspicion about the credibility of his perspective on other issues. And finally, there is the issue of nuclear waste. On this issue, we already talked a little bit earlier, so I won't repeat myself. Instead, you should watch a TED talk by Schellenberger that summarizes his points fairly well. It is the last link in the video description. To recap, many environmentalists warn us about the magnitude of the threat posed by fracking, factory farming, and waste generated by nuclear power plants. Schellenberger thinks that these warnings are often instances of environmental alarmism. According to him, fracking, factory farming, and nuclear energy are all safe. Those who oppose them are either ignorant or being emotional. I look forward to hearing your take on all of this. And this brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience, and I'll catch you next time.